The Godfather currently ranks number two on AFI's top 100 films of all time. It was the highest grossing picture of its year. It was the recipient of Oscars for Best Picture, Best Actor for Marlon Brando, and Best Adapted Screenplay for Francis Ford Coppola and Mario Puzo. It was nominated for another seven Academy Awards, including Best Supporting Actor for Al Pacino. Two years later, The Godfather Part II was nominated for 11 Academy Awards, once again earning Oscars for Best Picture, and for Best Adapted Screenplay. Robert De Niro won the Best Actor Oscar in the role originated by Marlon Brando in Part 1. Coppola won for Best Director and joked, <clears throat> I almost won this a couple of years ago for the first half of the same picture. Al Pacino was once again nominated, this time as Best Actor, but lost to Art Carney for Harry and Tonto, Paul Mazursky's coming of old age picture about a retiree's road trip with his cat. In 1990, Part 1 was selected for preservation by the American National Film Registry in recognition of its cultural significance. Part 2 would be selected three years later for the same honor. 1990 also saw the release of The Godfather Part 3 on Christmas Day. The Los Angeles Times dubbed it the most anticipated film of the decade. But the 16 years between sequels had an effect on the Academy's love affair with The Godfather series. Despite seven Academy Award nominations, Part 3 did not win Best Picture like its predecessors. It did not win Best Adapted Screenplay. For the first time in the series, Al Pacino's performance wasn't even nominated. As of this recording, the film is yet to be selected by the National Film Registry for preservation for its cultural significance. Nowhere in popular culture has there been a more reverential discourse on the Godfather films than in the HBO series The Sopranos. Yet the pilot episode also mirrors the court of public opinion when it comes to part three, which Carmela Soprano succinctly sums up. Does Tony prefers two, not one? Yeah, he likes the part where Vito goes back to Sicily. Three was like, what happened? <laughs> Indeed. Part three is the Fredo of the trilogy. Misunderstood, ignored, and murdered. At least in the press, and nowhere more famously than Peter J. Boyer's June 1990 Vanity Fair article, Under the Gun. It was highly critical of the film's various production problems and in particular Francis casting his young and inexperienced daughter Sophia in the pivotal role of Mary Corleone. Even Janet Maslin's piece in the New York Times, which was favorable, echoed the sentiment. Maslin defended the film stating, most film sequels are strictly optional. Godfather Part 3 is inevitable and as such, it's irresistible. But she too attacked Sophia's performance, writing, Ms. Coppola, the director's daughter, gives a flat, uneasy performance that seriously damages Mary's role as the linchpin of this story. The fact that Sophia only took the role because Winona Ryder, who was previously cast as Mary, dropped out the day before she was to begin filming, garnered little sympathy for the young actress. Her father, meanwhile, was charged with reckless nepotism. Al Hinson's Washington Post review seemed to sum up the immediate response to the film, a failure of heartbreaking proportions. When Coppola was preparing The First Godfather, the book was not yet the phenomenon it would soon become. When the second film was released, The First Godfather had only been around for two years. But by the time Part 3 was released, nearly two decades had passed. The Godfather films had become cultural institutions. How could Francis top one and two? In the wake of such insurmountable expectations, Part 3 was doomed to be a letdown. But nearly 22 years since its release, Part 3 is due for reappraisal. In the commentary track found on the film's DVD release, Coppola offers his explanation of exactly what happened and provides a convincing argument for the defense. First and foremost, this defense requires the viewer to imagine the film under a different title, one its authors preferred, The Death of Michael Corleone. This rescues it from the perception that all three films are equal contributions to one three-part series, which the significant gap between production of two and three contradicts. There are precedents for considering Godfather films in alternate contexts than this, especially in viewing part one and part two as necessarily entwined. A four-part television miniseries that aired on NBC in 1977, which reimagined the first two pictures as one chronological narrative, doing away with the flashback structure of part two. 
Scenes were put together again in a different order, and some scenes cut out to shorten the original films have been added. In a sense, the two Godfather films as seen in theaters are incomplete. This version, especially designed to be seen on television over four consecutive nights, is the complete story. This re-editing of the first two parts was employed again at a slightly reduced running time for the video release named The Godfather's Saga. With this in mind, imagine, if you will, the third picture not as The Godfather Part 3, a sequel to The Godfather and The Godfather Part 2, but rather as an epilogue to The Godfather's Saga, as Coppola and Puzo intended. Ironically, Coppola is to blame for the very concept of sequels titled with numerals. The first American picture to use this device was The Godfather Part II. Previously, the trend had been to give sequels independent titles in order to avoid confusing audiences who might presume they were being sold a product they had already purchased. Despite setting this trend, Coppola attributes his inability to convince the studio to accept his preferred title for Part III as an example of his declining influence and power. For the Coppola of 1990, was not the same man as the Coppola of 1974. The string of box office failures and personal tragedies, including the death of his oldest child, Gio, had humbled the man who had dominated the American cinema in the 1970s. Coppola ended his run of classics with Apocalypse Now in 1979, a venture that he jests, I never fully recovered from. When he finally accepted Paramount's offer to write and direct a third film in the now classic Godfather series, he was in no position to refuse. But as he had done throughout his career, he struggled over his obligations to deliver mainstream entertainment while looking to tell more intimate personal dramas. Michael Corleone once again serves as a mirror for his co-creator in part three. Here we see an aging patriarch, full of regret, unable to escape his own history. Considering the film as the death of Michael Corleone, it's a haunting, heartbreaking tragedy. Surprisingly tender in places and made by a much more mature filmmaker than the previous installments. It just wasn't the story audiences in 1990 wanted to see. The previous two films already canonized. They didn't want to see a diminished Michael Corleone, sick with diabetes, hair now grey and thinning. Interestingly, one of the greatest battles fought between Coppola and Paramount this time out was indeed over Coppola's desire to cut Pacino's hair. As Coppola explains, as soon as he cut and dyed Pacino's hair, losing the thick, slick back mane that had become iconic from the first two pictures, he announced to the audience that this was not the same virile, powerful Michael Corleone they had come to know. Rather than the unstoppable force of the first films, this established image, we have the Lear-like figure with a steely grey brush cut. Indeed, consider Act 3, Scene 2 of William Shakespeare's King Lear. And this scene from part three. Vincent! Run a thunderbird! Thunderbird! Harmless noise! Bullshit! Deceit, my old fuck! Out of fire! Coppola, bored by violence as entertainment at this point, uninterested in dreaming up new ways to kill somebody, dares to allow himself to be guided by Shakespeare in an attempt to deliver a deeper, richer drama. In addition to Michael as Lear, Talia Shire's Connie has transformed into something of a Lady Macbeth, steering the family towards more bloodshed with behind-the-scenes manipulations. Even the choice of the family's bastard son as the film's protagonist over Sonny, Michael, or Connie's legitimate sons, is an explicit nod to Shakespeare. The villain, Joey Zaza, reminds us, Corleone, all bastards are liars. Shakespeare wrote poems about it. Apart from the influence of the bard, Coppola and Puzo drew inspiration from the scandals surrounding the Vatican Bank and the death of Pope John Paul I. It is interesting to note that the Vatican at one time owned Paramount Studios. This notable narrative thread, controversial at the time, prefigures Puzo's final novel, The Family and the recent Showtime series concerning the Borgia family, but was not enough to draw attention away from the personal and self-referential Shakespearean elements to which audiences reacted so negatively. The story audiences wanted in 1990 was one that would have picked up from where Godfather Part II left off, the way the title suggests, repeating the formula of Michael as the always triumphant leader. It was a story written, but never made the rise of the Corleone family through the heroin and cocaine-fueled 1970s and 80s. 
This is what Mario Puzo referred to as the good years when we killed everyone and no one killed us. The original Godfather film was originally intended to take place in the then contemporary 1970s, before Coppola's involvement and his insistence on returning to the novel's period setting. Other versions of that 70s stories were later developed without Coppola's involvement. In 1985, a version co-written by Thomas Lee Wright included a character inspired by Mr. Untouchable, the notorious African-American gangster Nicky Barnes, eventually played by Cuba Gooding Jr. in Ridley Scott's American Gangster in 2007. Wright's version was intended to star Eddie Murphy in the Nicky Barnes role, and though it was never produced, it may very well have been the original source of what evolved into his screenplay for 1991's New Jack City, indicating a film that may have been more in line with what audiences expected. The film features Wesley Snipes in the Nicky Barnes role, and in the original Godfather tradition includes a climactic sequence that sees parallel events culminate in the eruption of violence during a family social ceremony. Here, a wedding, all woven together through music. Additionally, 90s R&B star Keith Sweat plays a Johnny Fontaine-esque role, Fontaine notably appearing in all three Godfathers. The parallels to Godfather even extend to part three. Consider the similarities in New Jack City's Church Steps Shootout with the killing of Mary Corleone on the opera steps in the climax to the death of Michael Corleone. The scene in which Snipes takes his vengeance against the Italian gangsters responsible for the church steps shootout seems very much like a holdout from the alternate Godfather 3 script. As does one exchange between Snipes and Ice-T, which echoes the dialogue and themes from the Godfather films. I was like, business fight. Well, in person. My brother, it's always business. Never personal. It's not personal, Sonny. It's strictly business. In 1990, another film that satisfied the audience's appetites and expectations that Part 3 did not was made by the director that Francis Coppola had tapped to helm Part 2 before the studio rejected the idea, Martin Scorsese. Nominated for Best Picture that year alongside the third Godfather, the film was Goodfellas. Goodfellas was the propulsive, highly kinetic, wildly funny and explosively violent mob picture in line with the expectations of a generation of viewers who grew up with the Godfather franchise. The film even fills in a missing chapter in the cinematic chronicle of America's mafia history between Godfather parts two and three. We see this desire for different periods of the mob filled in on screen in a number of other films beginning around this time. 1990's State of Grace gives us the Irish mob of 1980's Hell's Kitchen, as written about in T.J. English's excellent non-fiction book, The Westies. Other notable post-Godfather 3 pictures include the period said dramas Bugsy, Casino, and Donny Brasco. More contemporary in production and setting is the six seasons of The Sopranos, which paved the way for the Prohibition-era Boardwalk Empire. These and others complete the missing story, as if all of these films and series are in dialogue with one another since they all, along with the Godfather series, draw from the same well, the true stories and legends of America's underworld history. It is as if they all occupy the same universe. There was almost a fourth Godfather film set up in 1999 in the midst of these films, which might have satiated the audience's desire to see those types of stories through the eyes of the Corleones. It would have featured a parallel structure like Part 2 that would show Leonardo DiCaprio as a young Sonny Corleone and Andy Garcia becoming a gaudy-like 1980s mob boss. This again would have been more in line with audience expectations, all having learned from the mistakes of Part 3. And yet these films that have come out after Godfather Part 3 are precisely what allows us, 22 years later, to forget whatever criticisms that were leveled against the third Godfather picture at the time. They fulfill the expectation that was disappointed at that time. We can now judge it not for the film it isn't, but for the film it is. 
the great qualities it has as a singular film that comments back on the first two, but is not beholden to the purposes they served. Take, for instance, the most hated element, Sofia Coppola's performance. What is most striking today about the much maligned performance is the heartbreaking vulnerability of a young woman on the precipice of adulthood, not yet grown into herself, that permeates all of her scenes. In the years since she played Mary Corleone, Sophia has become an accomplished artist, a critical darling even, as a writer and director in her own right, a Best Screenplay Oscar winner for her much-loved Lost in Translation. The question of whether or not she earned the role of Mary Corleone is no longer relevant, and we can instead see what she accomplishes having grown accustomed to her. Though her California accent is a little distracting, we need only watch her eyes to see the value in her performance. It is, as Francis says, an extremely truthful performance. And is there anything so tender in any other Godfather picture as the doomed romance that develops between Mary and her cousin Vincent, as played by Andy Garcia? Sophia's death scene on the Opera House steps is arguably the most devastating of all the Godfather deaths, if for no other reason than Mary is the family's innocent one. The bullets intended for her father parallel the abuse she received in the media at the time, which was meant to injure her father and director. As Francis has said, there is no worse way to pay for your sins than to have your children included in your punishment. Lost in these public condemnations is Andy Garcia's performance as the bastard son, Vincent Mancini, which is one of the franchise's greatest assets. He pulls off a remarkable feat as he embodies the best and worst of the Corleones who came before him. Sonny's brash temper, Michael's calculating cold-bloodedness, and Vito's polished, graceful swagger and charisma, often, as in this scene, all at the same time. This again comments back on the series, though recognizing through the new actor the distance from that singular story in parts one and two. Let Drop go. your gun, man. He's gonna cut it through. What are you fucking crazy? I hardly know this part. What do you have the guy cut her? What the fuck do I care? <laughs> no. You got no choice, man. This chick's gonna be dead. You hurt her and I'll kill you both. You give up that knife, I'll let you go. You cut her throat, man! Right now! <laughs> hey! I wanna do something to convince you. Don't get frightened. Don't do any sudden movements. Just watch me, alright? Do you hear what I said? Yeah. Okay. Drop the knife. Go ahead. Stop it! Good boy. Sit down, I want to talk to you. This commentary is at its most clear during what is perhaps one of the most exciting sequences in any of the three pictures. Enjoy the opera. The climactic half hour that interweaves multiple assassination attempts and double crosses with a production of Petro Mascagni's opera Cavallaria Rusticana. Coppola has said that everything about the Godfather films, symbols, themes, characters, and narrative are rooted in that opera, and this is the film that lays this construct bare. It takes what has existed in the previous two parts and draws attention to its source. Consider the procession that recalls the killing of Fanucci during the Festa in Part 2. Furthermore, the depiction of biting off an enemy's ear in the opera harkens back to the earlier scene with Vincent and Joey Zaza in which he bites Zaza's ear. Kenny, you're crazy. What the hell's the matter with you? 
we are seeing the influence in the very same film, which is, from a distance, commenting on the first two parts. Ironically, it is Mary whose death ends this significant sequence, because to kill Michael here was not enough punishment in Coppola's estimation. Having learned firsthand the pain of losing your own child, Coppola inflicts the most severe punishment imaginable to his alter ego, the murder of his child. This illustrates to what degree this film is a reflection of Coppola's own life, more than a strict continuation of the first two films. To pay for the sin of killing his brother Fredo, Michael loses Mary. Death would only find Michael sometime later, an ironically peaceful passing of a man who has caused and known so much suffering and bloodshed in his life, which befits the length of time that separates part three from the closely intertwined first two parts. For Michael Corleone, death alone is no punishment. It only marks the end of his tragedy, an epilogue to the saga. Godfather Part 3 may be a disappointing sequel to a series of two films that are basically one, but as the death of Michael Corleone, it is a fitting epilogue to one of the greatest single films of all time, the collected Godfather Saga, and a worthy addition to the canon of American crime classics. Hey, Joey! Zaza. <laughs> <laughs>